Welcome to a special presentation by the Nature Conservancy's chief scientist, Peter Kariva. His lecture, Conservation in a Human-Dominated World Experiencing Economic Crisis, addresses conservation efforts as they stand today and how they need to progress, for the well-being of nature, certainly, but most of all, for people. Belmont University featured Dr. Kariva at an event sponsored with the Nature Conservancy. This televised version begins with brief comments from Belmont leaders and the Conservancy's Scott Davis on the significance of the event. The Nature Conservancy is the largest domestic and international conservation organization in the world, with land and water protection projects in every state and in 30 plus countries. The Conservancy has protected more than 15 million acres in the United States and more than 100 million acres around the world. In Tennessee, the Conservancy has helped save such special places as Radnor Lake, Savage Gulf, the Walls of Jericho, and the Duck River for people and for nature. We hope you find Dr. Kariva's insights thought-provoking and inspiring. When we found out that we were going to host the debates, we decided it was a wonderful time to celebrate uh, democracy in America. And uh, we actually uh, chose a theme called The Art of Being Free. It comes from a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville talking about the wonderful uh, uh, blessings uh, of the art of being free, but the challenge uh, of the art of the, uh, of the apprenticeship of being free. And uh, so it was a chance for us to talk to our students about citizenship, about the issues facing our country, about how to be engaged citizens, how to take what they learn and apply it in their communities and in the world. I'm Darlene Panvini and uh, I'm a professor in the biology department here at Belmont. And I also coordinate the environmental studies program. And so it's in that capacity as the coordinator of the environmental studies program that each year I get to invite um, a speaker for our annual environmental studies lecture. This is our fourth one. So, uh, so it's in that role that I um, have invited Dr. Kriva here today. So I'm a member of the Nature Conservancy and I get the Nature Conservancy magazine. And last spring I was in faculty meetings and we were brainstorming people that we could bring in. And I was in this faculty committee focused on the environment, entrepreneurship, the economy, and energy. And we were wanting to sort of coordinate our efforts in terms of bringing speakers onto campus this year that would have some connection with the debate and the art of being free, but yet would focus on those four themes as well. So a few days later, the spring issue of the Nature Conservancy magazine appears, and there's an interview in that um, issue with Dr. Kriva and some other conservationists talking about the poverty question and so I thought that would be a natural tie-in with the um, environment and the economy and so what I want my students um, to you know be aware of is just the role that the environment nature conservation that that plays in our everyday lives and in our science courses we're often so focused on the science that we don't sometimes show that connection between science and people, science and society, and so this gave me a perfect opportunity to make that connection. Um, and then it just happens that these issues are very timely um, today with the economy and the green movement. Uh, at Belmont, we try to do a lot of outreach to the community in all sorts of different ways, but I think particularly the Nature Conservancy with uh, the mission that you have and the idea that uh, you know, you're know you using science in the real world to inform policy and to, to do things like that. I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for our students uh, to learn how science really uh, informs public policy and can uh, improve the world. And so I think that it shows that uh, you can get a biology degree or a chemistry degree or uh, you know, a political science degree, let's say, and then you can go out in the world and uh, put it into practice and be a positive force. So that's, here we have uh, an environmental studies program, and that's really how this linkage came about. And uh, so the students in environmental studies can sort of see the real life of it. So what makes the Conservancy different, I think, than a lot of other conservation organizations is our reliance on the best available science. The Conservancy uses the best science out there. Some of it is generated by the, by the Conservancy and its own staff, but an awful lot of it comes from other places like Belmont University, where we have good, st we have good students, good professors, good programs that help us 
sort of develop and then translate a lot of that academic information to on-the-ground strategies for conservation. That really works for the Conservancy in terms of partnerships as well as really getting good conservation done. All right, well it's wonderful to see everyone here and uh, I want to welcome you to Belmont University. And I want to thank you for coming to the fourth annual Environmental Studies Lecture sponsored by the Environmental Studies Program. I also want to thank the Nature Conservancy for their support. Uh, they supported a uh, reception we just had and they've been very supportive all along, so thank you to them. We are honored to have Dr. Peter Kariva give the penultimate lecture in Belmont's lecture series, The Art of Being Free. The Art of Being Free is a year-long series of programs organized around the 2008 presidential town hall debate, which was hosted on our campus in October. The final lecture is Monday night, and that will feature author and historian David McCullough, and I do encourage all of you to come back on Monday and uh, get your ticket in advance, but uh, that'll be in the Curb Events Center, so that'll be a good night. The slogan for the Art of Being Free series is a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville and from his book, Democracy in America. And the book uh, is, of course, about de Tocqueville's account of democracy in 19th century America. And the full sentence of the quote has some relevance to tonight's talk, and so I'd like to share it with you. And it goes like this. It cannot be repeated too often. Nothing is more fertile in wondrous effects than the art of being free, but nothing is harder than freedom's apprenticeship, end quote. The apprenticeship of freedom is indeed a challenging vocation. And Dr. Peter Kariva has devoted his life to helping us wisely use our freedom in ways that res will result in a better world both today and in the future. And for that, he is a worthy selection for this Art of Being Free lecture series. To use another definition for the word free, as Dr. Kariva has pointed out, the benefits nature provides us and which we often take for granted are not actually free. Dr. Kariva observed that or conservation and environmentalism suffer from the good intentions are enough syndrome. In other words, there are innumerable strategies and tools for protecting the environment, but they differ greatly on how much good they accomplish for the cost. In a world with finite resources, Dr. Kariva has argued for, for focusing on protecting ecosystems that are most vital to people's health and their needs for survival. Unless conservation is better connected to people and their needs, he maintains, it will fail. Dr. Kariva is the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy. He advocates a conservation approach that provides resources for human health and survival, while at the same time protecting species and ecosystems. A university scientist by training, Dr. Kariva has published and lectured widely on the need for 21st century con conservation that goes beyond setting aside protected areas just for rare plants and animals. He moved to the Nature Conservancy after 20 years as a university professor, and his scholarship is in two primary areas. First of all, he's involved in research that's aimed at asking whether conservation strategies are delivering what they promise to deliver. To take one example, do projects that claim to improve the environment and help reduce poverty actually do so? Second, he argues that conservation will fail unless it is better connected to people. He is working on tools that allow considerations of nature's assets in ways that inform the choices we make every day in local communities, at the state level, as nations, and globally. Dr. Kariva received his BA from Duke University, magna cum laude, in zoology, his MS from the University of California, Irvine, in environmental biology, and his PhD from Cornell University in ecology and environmental biology. He has over 80 peer-reviewed publications, over 40 book chapters, symposia, volumes and review articles. His research covers diverse fields such as mathematical biology, insect ecology, genetically engineered organisms, agricultural ecology, behavioral ecology, landscape ecology, and global climate change, just to name a few. Dr. Kariva maintains connections with several universities. He still advises students and also teaches courses. He strongly believes that undergraduates can contribute to meaningful research publications that do make a difference. Over his academic career, he's published numerous papers with undergraduates, and I personally am always impressed with scholars who see the value in working with undergraduates in research activities, especially publishing research papers with those same undergraduates. 
The title of his talk is Conservation in a Human-Dominated World Experience and Economic Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Kariba. Okay, I'll probably go pretty fast, because uh, once I get going, that's what happens. Um, you, you know, some of you are here because you're students and you have to be, and sorry about that. It's a good thing that there's not a, uh, good thing there's not an NCAA game on tonight. Uh, but um, the rest of you are probably here because you're some interest in the environment. And so I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour that's going to be a little bit historical, a little bit scientific, and a little bit personal that tries to capture, you know, some of the challenges we face in conservation and a sort of a renaissance I think we need to take if we are to succeed. And just to remind you, uh, one of my heroes, heroines, I guess, would be Rachel Carson. If any of you have ever read her biography, it, 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 haven't read it, it's really worth reading. An astonishing woman. She changed the world and she got ridiculed for it and suffered an awful lot of abuse for it as hysterical woman and so forth. This is a, a full page ad in Time Magazine. See how the world has changed? Look at that. I mean, there's your, your housewife there in her apron and just dancing around and saying how good DDT is. And scientists were saying that it was magical what it was going to do. And, and Rachel, it, if you really trace it, it was her appearance on a 60 minute show and then followed up by um, uh, congressional testimony that really led to, really set the pace for what I call the golden era, other people have called it, of environmentalism. These three acts, hugely important environmental acts that the rest of the world has copied. When these came out, we were the leader in it. We were the first to take on every one of these issues and we did it better than everybody. And it wasn't Republican versus Democrat, uh, unanimous Senate vote, unanimous. Senate vote to pass the Endangered Species Act. No party affiliations whatsoever. So that's a pretty good start. A lot has changed since then. Of course, when I, I was born in 51, that's when Elvis had his first rec record. But um, look at the population that's changed. Um, the global population there, a little over two and a half billion in 51, now 6.8 billion. Pretty soon it will have tripled. There are people who thought it was crowded when I was born. Um, just for those of you who might be freshmen or sophomores, since you were born, we've added 1.6 billion. That's a lot of people to, be, to add. And by 2050, it'll be 9 billion. That's an enormous rate of population growth. It's slowing down, but the, the impacts of that are enormous. And I've just listed some of these here, and I don't want to do it in a doom and gloom way. You just have to recognize the planet is filled with, it's not filled. The planet is dominated by people. There are a lot more of us than you can imagine. And they've grown at a pace that it's hard for you to appreciate. So we've altered the world's climate. I mean, think about it. We're one species, and we've fundamentally altered the world's climate. We're warming the planet, causing increasing severity of storms, contributing to sea level rise. That's an amazing impact. Nitrogen, one of the most basic you know, elements there is, essential for, you know, for biological organisms. We've doubled the amount of it available in the world. Half the world's fresh water we appropriate for irrigation or consumption. Half of the world's fresh water. We so, there's lots of funny stories you can tell, but we so tame nature that, any of you have any idea how many uh, tigers there are in the wild? Any wild guesses? 5, 000, there's 5,000 tigers in the wild, a little under 5,000. We have that many tigers in captivity as in the U.S. We have as many tigers in captivity in the U.S. as we have in the wild. How about what's, what, what is our vertebrate enemy? What, you know, what vertebrate uh, causes the most human deaths a year? Snakes, what, what would I be? Deer, by far, because we hit them with cars. That's a nature, you know? 
Our predator is deer because we hit him with cars and we have more tigers as pets than there are in the wild. It's a different world. I just put this up here to show it's, it's just an animation. We've dammed uh, you know, so many of the rivers and this just uh, play it, we'll just play it twice. And these are major dams, more than 15 meters. And it's still going. And in fact, it's accelerating because dams are clear in energy. So the places where they're not dams in Asia, Africa, and, Braz and um, Brazil, are where they're being built, they're just being expected to be built at a record-baking pace in the next two or three years. How about, you know, our global economy? This is a, a figure we put together, and it shows shipping lanes and roads. You can't, it doesn't show up that well, but look at the land first. The pink is to, is to represent roads, and the gray is where there's no roads. Well, you see, most of all the land is sort of beige-ish pink. That's road density. But look at the shipping lanes. You'd think the oceans are pretty big. Well, it's no accident that many whales, what are, what, whales get run, hit by ships. We don't harvest whales anymore. But the right whale, one of the major sources of mortality, is getting hit by a ship. How do you get hit by a ship out in the middle of the ocean? Well, that's why. So how relevant in this world is, 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 is being an environmentalist in conservation? It's a human-dominated world. We control the climate. We've changed it. You know, how much wilderness is left? I don't think there's a place you can go that we haven't touched it in some significant, measurable way. Apparently not very relevant at all. Apparently not very relevant at all. This is a, a, a poll Nicholas, for, at the Nicholas Institute at Duke, a recent one. And this asks, what were the most important issues to you? The bottom, they've repeated this. Every year, the bottom is the environment. The bottom. It always scores lower than everything. I mean, everybody says, therefore, you know, that we get a misimpression because everybody will say casually, Therefore, a good environment. Of course you are. That's like saying, you know, do you love your mother? You're not going to say, you know, you're, you're not for a good environment, a clean environment, green, everything. Who's going to say that? So everybody says that they're for the environment. But is it really important to them? No, it is not. In fact, people that make a living the way I do um, are not reasonable, apparently. And it's increasing. So this is a poll. And uh, it's gotten worse since 1996. And that eight years is a significant increase in the number of people that think that environmentalists are not reasonable people. Hmm. This is uh, really striking. This just came out in the newspapers uh, maybe four or five weeks ago. Some of you may have seen this. Um, there's a poll of attitudes that the Pew uh, Research Center does. It, <coughs> They, they do all sorts of attitudes, political attitudes, Iraq war, every, all the sort of, you know, like 100 different attitudes. And they do it and they just track it. And, you know, news, the media picks up on it and people talk about it. Um, but one of the things they asked was about the environment. So they're not asking what's, they're just asking is it important. Um, the economic downturn affected all the things. But you know what was most affected? By far what took the biggest beating was the environment. So that we have a Wall Street screws up. We have this um, collapse in the Wall Street market. And you know what hurts the most? The environment. You see a significant drop, steeper than any other issue. Wall Street didn't change views on Iraq war that much. It didn't change views on health care that much. It didn't change views on education that much. But it did change views on the environment. And you have publications like this. It's entitled The Death of Environmentalism. Um, uh, they later wrote a book, what is it called? Um, oh, I can't remember it now. Breakthrough or something like that. Um, the Breakthrough Institute, I believe that's it. But this, was, this is available on the web. And there are political scientists that were trying to understand why we didn't come to grips with global climate change. And this was widely circulated in, in, inside the Beltway. All the NGOs read it, all the environmental groups, a lot of congressional staff read it. So, you know, where is environmentalism? Yes, everybody is for a good environment, but what will we really do for it? Will we vote for it? Will we actually, you know, how much will we really do for it? Well, 
The solution, I think, is we have to think about the environmental issues in a different way. And the economists um, ran an issue a couple years ago. This was the front page of it. It's pretty significant for the economists, which for a long while didn't believe that global climate change was happening, to come out and recognize global climate change and start to take on environmental issues. But the three things we have to do, and that's what I'm going to go through quickly, is reconnect people with nature, recognize that nature is a good investment. It ought to be really easy for us to recognize that in these times when we see some of the investments we've been making. And, and, think, and, and frame the issue of conservation in a different way. Frame the issue of conservation for it being about choosing our future. And let me talk about the first one, reconnect people with nature. This is just one of, you know, over a dozen graphs I could take. Every data set that records outdoor recreation, visits to national parks, backpacking, Appalachia Trail, fishing, hunting, every one of them shows a downward trend in the last 20 to 30 years. Every one of them in the US, not a single ex exception, and pretty steep downward trends. Last year was the first year most of the world lived in cities. First year. And you're part of a generation that averaged, when you were growing up, less than an hour. I believe it was actually, I think the statistics, I'm not sure I'm remembering this right, but I think it was 30 minutes a week in outdoor play, unsupervised outdoor play growing up. Um, you know, my generation, it was four to five hours a week and probably much more. So um, urbanized, very little outdoor play, very little outdoor recreation, much less connection to nature. What do you do? Average adolescent today in the, in the US spends 45 hours a week uh, watching TV or in front of a computer. That's OK, but you should do it at night. You know, stay up all night and do that. Don't. During the day, go outdoors. Um, but uh, so we spend a lot of time not in nature, not outdoors. But um, and I have 19-year-old, 19-year-old daughters, 17-year-old son, and there are no exceptions. I just uh, am on their case all the time about it, but I drag them with me sometimes. And you know that's a significant issue. If you don't have any experience with nature, you're not going to value it. There's no way you are. If you have no experience with nature, you're not going to value it. But it's not just about conservation. I mean, it, there's, if any of you have read the book by Richard Louv, Last Child Left in the, in the Woods, um, he started a movement. It's a children in nature movement. If Wall Street hadn't collapsed, you'd see a lot of environmental programs started all around the US about it. Wall Street's collapse hurt that movement. I think it'll resurge. He started a movement about this, but there's lots of really interesting studies come in, coming in. The, the outdoor, the experience helps children focus. They do better on tests afterwards. Um, better able to lead, deal with stress. There's actually one really nice longitudinal study. It's a nice study where um, a lot of these studies, it's hard to interpret them because often if you compare kids who have access to nature to kids who live in cities, you're comparing socioeconomic classes. And there's confounding factors. But there's really kind of a cool study that was done where they took uh, kids that lived in the same neighborhood and then they moved to different places. So they're the same population and some moved to be more exposed to nature and some moved to be less exposed to nature. And they um, tested them for responding to stress like moving, divorce, being new in school, um, being picked on in school and so forth. And with the more access to nature, much happier, much more easy to deal with stress. And of course, ob obesity. Obesity's doubled in the last decade in children under 13. So children and nature programs are, are a good investment. But we're going to have to start making it. Uh, because if, 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 the, if there is no connection with nature, no matter what else I say, uh, it's going to be a hard sell. And that connection is, I know, I talk to people who give money to the Nature Conservancy. I talk to people who work for it. Most of us had some sort of experience with nature. 
Uh, this is just pictures. We do have programs. Within our organization, uh, Nature Conservancy, states differ. We have a tremendous diversity of what people think are important, but there's a really, it's kind of a cool program because it's a personal friend of mine that set it up in New York City. She got people to fund it. She takes urban kids from New York City, originally from pretty poor neighborhoods, and takes them out to do the stewardship work. So they're working. It's not an education program. They're getting rid of invasive species on TNC preserves in New York. She gets 40 to 60 kids a year out there in the summer, and we're now doing longitudinal studies. I, that's too small a scale, but I bet you that's going to have a lifelong impact on those kids. I, I like to think of it as going to be making leaders and not just people who appreciate nature. But these are just some pictures from it, and they're, it's just amazing. Area of re we, what we don't know, I, I, I think, thanks to Richard Louvre, thanks to his book, Thanks to this move, movement of his, the Children in Nature movement, the Children's Forum, uh, there is some momentum in this direction, but we actually don't know what environmental education works. Do you have to do it for a month? Is a weekend field trip enough? A few afternoons after school? We don't know. It'll be, so, and it's expensive. In budget cuts, how many school districts would have environmental ed? So, I think we need it, but we also need to do it wisely. Next one, another project that I'm personally involved in, which I spend a lot of my time, we call it the Natural Capital Project. It's Stanford University, World Wildlife Federation, and the Nature Conservancy. And it's basically a project that's all geared to making it easy for people in countries and states to go to a place and identify the value of natural systems we have economists. We actually convert it to dollars in many cases. We don't always have to do it. But we have three PhD economists, young kids we hired, but really good ones that help us do it. But we, we could do it in terms of clean water, in terms of cultural values, whatever. We go around the world and are starting to try to help that shape land use decisions. Um, and you know, all of you know this, but you don't have to be a scientist at all to understand. You all know that nature, but food comes from nature, fiber, timber, pollination, fish, clean water, holding soil on the ground, sequestering carbon to mitigate climate change. All um, wetlands along the coast that, that, that um, depress storm surge. There's an awful lot of well-documented, nothing complicated, huge amounts of, of experimental direct observational data that shows these things that, that you actually would be willing to pay for. You know, to have your house along the coast not washed away in a hurricane. So those are nature's assets. But, you know, I'm just going to talk about water. Water is a big one. Because we're, we're using water inefficiently, we take a lot of it, and climate change is, is creating some extra stress there. Um, it's a big industry already. It's as big as the pharmaceutical industry. There's a water is as big an industry as the pharmaceutical industry. Bottled water. I give you the figure there. It says one in six Americans will drink only bottled water. It might be some of you, I, sorry if I offend you, but that's nuts. Um, maybe I'm not sorry, but that is nuts. <laughs> you know? Our tap water is plenty good. Um, and and it caught, it's just so costly. Um, but you know, so we, we're building up this industry that pays for, for bottled water, a huge industry, and yet one billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. And the only place they could get it is from natural ecosystems. They don't have treatment plants, but if they had forested lands and natural ecosystems, they would get clean water. I put this on, this is a, a, a Nature Conservancy. Nothing I say should be attributed to the Nature Conservancy because I'm a terrible spokesperson. But they do some good work, so every once in a while I, I have to talk about some of their really cool projects. Um, uh, but we have a project in, in um, Ecuador, the Condor Bioreserve, and, so, and, and the guys who got this started are so neat. One of them is this crazy lawyer who knows everybody in Colombia and Ecuador, and another one is a biologist, and they're just, they work really well. They're neat guys. And, um, there's this, this reserve upstream from Quito, the capital of the biggest city in Ecuador, 
tremendous wildlife. You know, all conservationists would want to protect it, but it's encroached by agriculture, grazing, and things like that. Well, there's a social problem, a problem that people care about. And in Quito, the water supply um, is not being met, the population is not getting enough water, and the water quality is really poor, many times undrinkable. Well, guess what? what? A lot of that water comes from up in the reserve. And so what they did with, with some USAID money and from some Nature Conservancy money from philanthropy is they started a fund. They got it going. A water fund, they call it. But then they, now it's, it's supported by hydropower. Why does hydropower care? Not just for, they care actually about not having sediments in the water. You get sediments in the water, you can't make as much electricity, the reservoir fills in too much. Obviously, a municipal water supplier wants clean water. Obviously, beer, you've got to clean water for beer, so a brewery gives money to this. Florists do as well. And now the, the citizens do. So money is, is paid, handed by corporations and citizens, and it goes to protecting that natural area upstream to help give clean water. Directly. And um, spe we, we've spent a lot of it, this is old, this slide is a couple uh, years old, but part of the protection is planting trees to cut down on the erosion, uh, more park guards to enforce so you don't put cattle too close to the streams. You really don't want cattle too close to your drinking water stream. Um, and uh, at actually setting up monitoring to make sure that scientifically they're doing a good job in lots of education programs. 42,000 children uh, educated so far through their environmental education programs. Really good thing. Um, that's the, in case you're there, that's the beer to drink, you're, that's green beer. Well, it turns out those water funds, those same guys have gone around Latin America and I don't know if they work as well. The place I've been besides Quito is Bogota, and they're working very well there. But they've replicated them in 14 Latin American cities. It's different culturally. The finance is slightly different. But in all cases, the idea, it's so simple. Cities need clean water. Where do they get that clean water? You know, these aren't countries that can afford to build hugely expensive treatment plants. They get them from forested areas and watersheds you know, upstream, and they put the money into conserving them. That's conservation for people. Uh, we're now trying to get that, so it's not, the problem is doing it one city at a time, it's not fast enough. We gotta do it better, we have gotta go to the country. I mean, I wanna get, I wanna get Colombia and Brazil to have water funds, not, you know, Bogota and Quito. So we're not done, but it's a good idea. Is any of this relevant to, to home? Here's a really interesting project. I, I'm su I was surprised to learn that Nature Conservancy did this, because I think of us as so much about you know, bugs and bunnies and birds and stuff. But we did this with NOAA in the Florida Panhandle. And we got together with NOAA, which has very good flood frequency models. So the pink here is what will flood, a 100-year flood. So when they say, when they say things like a 100-year flood, that means uh, once every hundred years, on average, you might expect a flood of this size. If it's a thousand year flood, it would be a bigger flood and rarer. If it's a ten year flood, it would be a smaller flood and more common. Doesn't mean for sure it's going to happen, it's just a, a statistical expectation. And we also mapped vulnerable communities. So this was uh, planners, TNC planners, who normally map where uh, endangered species are and plants are, mapping communities with high illiteracy, lots of elderly who don't speak English and live in trailers. Why do we map those? Those are the people that when the storms come are most vulnerable. So we map vulnerable coastal communities. Uneducated, elderly, poor live in trailers. They don't get up and move. They're getting hammered when the hurricanes come. We mapped them. And then we did what we, we overlaid the flood maps we found which one of those communities were going to get nailed by the floods. And then we overlay, you can appreciate this, this is just overlaying maps. Beautiful work though. Then we mapped what we always do well. We mapped the habitats we carried about, and I'm not going to keep doing this, and we mapped threatened and endangered species. We did all this mapping, which we're really good at. 
and we ended up with a map of high priority places to do conservation because their habitats that have species that are threatened and endangered but also protect vulnerable communities. That means when we do conservation there, we're protecting threatened and endangered species, we're protecting those salt marshes and habitats, and we're protecting those people who live in trailer parks who really get hammered by the storms. That's conservation for people, and it's a very good project. Who would have thought we did that? We do. So part of that message is, you know, if we just understood the value of nature, if we really started taking these things, we don't get credit for it. We tell people we're protecting species. Yes, we're protecting species. We're doing a lot more. We deserve full credit. That's something all students can understand. OK, this is the last part. We still got a problem, though. You know, we got another 3 billion people we're about to add. We got huge energy demands. We have an economic recession now. And how are we going to accommodate people and economic development and nature? So it's not just about vulnerable uh, coastal communities along the panhandle of Florida. It's economic growth. So uh, this is a project. This is done with an undergraduate. So um, she went um, uh, on to dental school, actually. She, wasn't even in, she was an environmental studies major, but she went on to dental school. She helped with this. And um, so we said, you know, there's all these articles written about it. Why don't we do some research? Well, who does more economic development than anybody? World Bank. They have a terrible database. So what we did is so simple. Anybody could have done it, but the hard work was what the student did. Because they don't have a good database, you have to get World Bank project reports. After they do a project, a development project, they do a report, they hire an outside contractor, they come in and they evaluate and they score it along all sorts of criteria about how well it works for the private sector, for poverty alleviation, for environment, and all sorts of things. So we couldn't get that data. We had to get lists of reports do some randomized sampling, get the actual reports physically, big PDF files, and go through them and find it. They have 10,000 projects. You'd think they would have computerized it. I think I'm, I'm going to sell our database to them. <laughs> um, but it's amazing. So we asked a simple question. What, I mean, what's a simplest experimental design? They have projects. All their projects are development projects. Every project they do is an economic development project. But sometimes they also have an environmental component where they're trying to, I mean, it, it's actually a goal not to hurt the environment, but it's a goal to help the environment, often biodiversity and what's, that's growing. So we asked if a World Bank project adds the environmental component, does it hurt its ability to do development? Not at all. So without reading the graphs, all that you have to know is that the blue and the green roughly look, you know, this graph well, roughly looks the same because it's all I, it means is that there's no effect. What it is is the way they score their projects are as high, substantial, um, and modest or negligible. And that's in this case, this is how they scored them for poverty re reduction. So they scored a lot of projects that we randomly sampled, and we had match pairs. Good experimental design. We'd go into a country in Africa and find an de economic development project, and we'd find an economic development project plus environment. And we'd ask these, and we'd have to do that for hundreds of projects to get this. And um, just as good at poverty reduction, you had the environmental component, the biodiversity component. Even just as good at private sector development? That's not poverty, private sector development. That's e just as good. <laughs> No difference. So the private, any project whose primary objective is environment, do as well on economic and social scores um, it, as do purely development projects. So if they've taken on an environmental focus, they still always have development, but if they've taken on an environmental focus, they essentially get a win-win. Now, the reason you don't realize this is that because most World Bank projects fail. I mean, it's because it's hard to do economic development in Africa. It's hard to do poverty. It's hard to do conservation. So what you end up, the, the, you know, if you don't analyze the question scientifically, what you end up seeing is that most World Bank projects fail. 
they're really hard to do, and so we can't do economic development and conservation at the same time. But it's just, it's hard to do hard things. The fact of the matter is, when you add the conservation dimension to them, it doesn't make them fail anymore. It doesn't make them fail anymore. So, I, I, maybe I, it's, it's a little too optimistic to call it win-win, I should say, you know, um, not lose, not lose or something. Um, <laughs> But the interesting thing is you can flip the question. Guess what? If you look at environment, how the environment fares, you do see a win-lose. Same type of data, same type of experimental design of these projects. If they do development projects with no in environmental objectives, then their environmental scores are significantly poorer. The policy implications are obviously, the World Bank should never do development without also trying to protect the environment because it doesn't hurt its development. And if it does development projects without paying attention to the environment, it does hurt the environment. There are other ways of thinking about it. This is by one of my colleagues, um, Joe Kiesecker. He's a state scientist for Wyoming. Um, now, he's a regional scientist, one of our many scientists. He got the idea, you know, he went to the West and looked around and looked at what the land use was going to be, and tremendous energy exploration demands. And so he got together with the energy industry and mapped the West for oil and gas potential. This is where there would be potential for drilling sites. Many of these are already leased. The leases have been given. So he mapped that. Uh, huge area, lots of potential, but very proactive, thinking ahead. Thinking ahead and saying, you know, there's going to be a lot of energy exploration in the West. I care about conservation in the West. And then he mapped sage grouse, among a, a lot of other species. And he mapped their areas and overlaid them with all sorts of different energy explorations scenarios. He took those maps to BP, big energy firm, he took him to BP and said, will you support this research? Will you support this work? Because I can tell you how to explore for energy, how to get your energy, and, and not hurt the wild earth. There are, you have options. There are places you can go and drill and get energy and not hurt the wildlife. There's such a big expanse out there. Will you fund this? Will you work with this? And they said, yes. I mean, they saw there were enough options. So we're interested, you know, if you, if you wait too long, if you wait for it to be a crisis, there's no options for business, and you pin them in a corner. But if you have a little bit of a vision, you can go to them early enough, and there's options. And so we have a partnership now, an official partnership between BP and Nature Conservancy to explore this. You know, it, and, and, and to work on this. It's good, it makes good sense, right? There's no legal, you know, it doesn't say, you know, may, you know for, they might come up, it's not, it's not a binding, it's not legal in the sense that, uh, that, you know, they're not obligated to not drill where it doesn't hurt a species. They're not obligated, and that's fine, that's as it should be, but they help support the science, it gives them the information to make a, um, an informed decision. So I'm going to end with sort of two personal stories that are part of this because they, they re reflect how I've come to this and I'll wrap up. Um, Twenty years ago I was heavily involved in the spotted owl trials. At three, I was involved in, th in, in three of them, a whole series of trials. But in one of them, so they were in the federal courthouse in downtown Seattle. And uh, you know, being involved in a high profile environmental trial will change your views on environmental science and all this. Um, but one of the things that was, you know, I thought I was a good guy. And so I'm there as an expert witness talking about don't cut down old growth forests because it's going to drive spotted owls extinct. And in the back of the courtroom, which was about this size, in the back of the courtroom were loggers with their, two, and, and at the time, you know, um, I had a kid, infant. They, would, they had the, uh, their kids on their shoulders and they shake the kids. The kids would cry. And they had signs that said, you'd rather feed spotted owls than my children. So it got painted 
as a picture of, of, of a war between heartless conservationists who cared more about spotted owls than they did about the loggers' children because their fathers were going to be out of work. That's how that debate got cast in many settings. You don't want conservation like that. That's a lose-lose debate. And so there they were dramatizing it. It's not always the industry that dramatizes it. Then I went to work for NOAA Fisheries. And part of my job was to do the science, but I also had to go to town meetings all over the place. Um, this is a full page ad. Is salmon extinction the legacy we'll leave? This is about the Snake River dams and whether you can take them out. Snake River dams do a lot of harm. But it just so happens in these dams, they spent over a billion dollars to re-engineer them, so they did a lot less harm. Um, so look, I mean, there's a picture. It could have been my daughter then, you know, looking at this extinct fish. Um, don't let a museum be the only place your grandchildren see this fish. Very emotional. You know, very. They published this ad. I used to. So I knew the. I was a modeler in those days. I knew population models, and they were certain. They said, without prompt action, if you don't take out all four of these dams, the wild Snake River Spring Chinook will be extinct by 2017. Pretty confident, huh? And I used to stand up. I used to say, I'll bet my house they won't. And I never got a taker. They're not going to go extinct. They're not, those dams are not coming out. Um, and there's no way those fish will be extinct in 2017. Anybody here want to take my bet? Take that bet? bet my, uh, we'll match houses. That Chinook salmon will not be extinct in 2017. I don't care what we do to the dams. Well, it will not. Now, there is ecological damage by the dams. And so the dams are a serious environmental issue. But why do you have to overstate it so much like this? Why do you have to paint it so black and white? It's not that simple. They will not be extinct. I know that. As a, I mean, I know the numbers. And in fact, they've increased since then. So what we have done, what we have to change, is we frame the environmental discussion in the wrong way. We talk about it just being a matter of greed. We make it the economy versus conservation or nature. We tell gloom and doom stories. That's good for getting newspaper attention. It's not good for solving the problems. In fact, I don't think humans have been all that stupid. I think if you look at how we've impacted the planet, you know, we're a species like any other species. We try to reproduce, take care of our young, protect our young, secure resources. That's what we've done. Right? We've acted like other species, naturally. Um, but we're at a stage now where because of our increasing population size, coupled with the, the impacts of our technology, we do have some key choices before us. And that's the, where we're at. But we can't keep framing it the way we have framed it. So the way I would like to frame it is this way. Nature is, in fact, our best investment. Even if you don't like nature, I mean, even if, going, if you want to sit in front of your, your video, play video games all day and you hate nature, nature's still a really good investment so you can have sustainable food, so you can have clean water, so you can not have the soils blowing away, and so maybe if you live near the shoreline, you won't get hammered by a hurricane. So nature's a really good investment. We're at a situation now where we still have options. We've made it too black and white, like, there's not, like it's people versus olives. Actually, it could be people and olives. Not people, it's not those, those loggers, kids versus olives. You can have both. Um, and we also have to change. There's, it used to frustrate me when I worked for the federal government. I did a lot of work with the Endangered Species Act. And it's, and it's common when you work with the Endangered Species Act that species that are listed you get goals for what you're supposed to do to get them off the list, to get them delisted. And those goals are often historical. 
And so there are a lot of people that would sit there and say, well, we have to get 50% of their abundance that in 1800. Of course, nobody knows what their abundance is, and scientists spend a lot of time dreaming up numbers that they, I don't know how they get those numbers. And I think, what a what strange way to work, look at it. It's a different world. It's especially a different world because of climate change. Have your goals determined. The past teaches you things. It teaches you a lot. You don't ignore the past. But have a goal for the future that is simply a goal for the future. What do you want nature to look like? What are some of the practical scenarios? Stop thinking about man as a blight on a planet. We're not a blight on a planet. We're a species that's reproduced and gotten resources. Um, and so I would reframe conservation in terms of, I still like the word conservation, but too much it gets, you know, it becomes an ideology about preserving a past, and it should be a vision for a future. Conservation should really be a vision for the future where both people and nature prosper. And so that, I'll, I'll add with this sort of, it, 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 that the way we have to reframe conservation is so that we make clear these links between nature and people. So it's conservation for people, not versus people. And I'll just tell you an interesting story. I'll get back to this investment. So I, we have a new boss, a new CEO of Nature Conservancy. After he got hired on, he came from Goldman Sachs. He must be really smart because he left Goldman Sachs before uh, Wall Street collapsed. So I'm sure we got a really good CEO. And so I asked him, you know, I knew, I, I, I knew what it, I mean, he took a huge salary cut. Just like, and he's got kids in college and normal guy, a good guy. And I said, why in the world did you do this? And he had a really interesting phrase, just a casual conversation. He probably doesn't even remember it, but it stuck with me. He said, well, you know, it just seemed more real than what I was doing on Wall Street. And doesn't that really ring true? Doesn't it really ring true that, that working to conserve nature and investing in nature seems more real than a lot of what those folks are doing? And uh, so that's why we should preserve nature. And thanks a lot. Conservation today is less about preservation of the past and more about preparation for a future we all want. To read more about Dr. Kariva or to learn how you can support the Nature Conservancy's work, visit nature.org. In 1977 in Johannesburg, South Africa, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. By the age of nine, he was already out playing him. The odds of this gentle lad winning the Junior World Golf Championships at the age of 14, one in 16 million. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours, one in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the Open Championship once and the US Open Championship twice, one in 780 million. The odds of this professional golfer having a child diagnosed with autism, one in 150. Ernie Else encourages you to learn the signs of autism at autismspeaks.org. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. I present to you Algebra 2 Foreign Languages and finally Biology Who among you will step up to their challenge? Me Yeah, do it. Me too Sign me Take up. on the tough classes now You need them to prepare for college G morning sunshine. 
Wakey, wakey. Text me back. Hey, did you tell your parents about us? Let's skip first period together. Did you get all my texts? Is practice over yet? Where are you at? Are you with your friends? That's L-A-A-A-A-M-M-E-E-E. -E -E. Capital X, lowercase o, capital X, lowercase o. I love you. JK, I hate you. JK, are you ignoring me? We're in a huge fight right now. Is this something I did? I can see your lights on. I'm coming this over. Isn't a what do you dream about? Did me? I'm lonely. Holla back. Holla back. Let's try something new. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. <laughs> What's up? This is my uh, this is my friend Rob from Michigan. What's up? He's a teenager. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Woo! Hey, hey, you want to slow down there? No. Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> what are you doing? We're shooting a viral video. <laughs> Hold on, I want to see this. Hey, this is his last five minutes on Earth. <laughs> a little something to mom. Say something to mom. How about goodbye, mom? Sorry. <laughs> So, do you have any questions? What is your soup of the day? Uh, we have a mulligatawny soup. Oh, do you have any specials? We have a steak special today. Oh, how is that cooked? That's pan seared and then... Does it come with a side dish? Is it grilled? Can I have it steamed? So, what do you recommend? What kind of pie do you have? You an actor. Aren't you from Ohio? Any questions? Ask questions. For the 10 questions everyone should know, go to ahrq.gov. No matter where you live, life in the ocean depends on you. <laughs> to help protect our ocean, recycle and dispose of your trash properly. <laughs> to learn what you can do, go to keepoceansclean.org. My joints ache so bad, I wake up in pain every day. I want to know why. I want to know why my hair is falling out. How did this happen? How did this happen? A little pain in my knee. That's how it started. That's how it started. This rash on my face, now it's like my body is attacking me. I want answers. When you don't have the right answers, it may be time to ask your doctor the right question. Could I have lupus? Open a book, you can explore new lands, make new friends, and discover new adventures. There are amazing possibilities when you open your mind to reading. Explore new worlds. Read. I'm Jeremy Call, and I made suction tires. Wait, what? Wait. I used a rivet gun to connect the um, suction cups and then they, I just connected it to the tire. Um, I got the idea from an octopus because of the suction cups and, um, I don't know. Anything's possible. Keep thinking. Get started on your invention at inventnow.org. Take out meals for just $12.99. Call it. Sherry Pearson. You are the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. <gasps> I'm rich! This can't be real. Of course it's not real. Come on. Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. So you're the new girl. Yes. That's cute. Go on in. Mr. Felsnikov? Thank you for overlooking my credit score. I was in college and I charged up a whole bunch of things that I really couldn't afford. Who knew employers checked that? Hey, kid, I don't credit check you. You don't credit check me. Capiche? And sometimes it floods in here. You might want to start wearing boots. Potential employers can check your credit. Don't let your bad credit put you in a bad job. Oh, those boys. 
are much too much. Those boys are much too much. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We got the spirit. We're hot. We can't be stopped. We're going to beat them and bust them. Beat them. The smallest beat moments beat can have the biggest beat impact beat on a beat child's beat life. Beat a little bit rowdy, R O W D Y. Take time to be a dad One more today. Time. All those boys are much too much. 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 Those boys are much too much.